back to the damage done. Uh, Mason here, Mike Thompson here, new friend of the show. Bruce Gray. Hello, everybody. Bruce Gray up in here. Uh, for most of you that have been following us for long enough, the typical format is more of the, the murder, the redemption, things of that nature. But now that we are, we're, we are doing things with Mike... Um, we're gonna add some. We're gonna add some more flavor and interest as as we roll forward with some of the murder and redemption angles, uh, and something that Mike and I briefly talked about uh, is the interest with Charles Manson. Correct, Mike. Yes. And yes, as it pertains so. to you. Well, yeah, and you know the thing I've had um, a number of um, requests that I appear on. Uh, different shows. I think um, Charlie's son has one show, and one of his representatives has uh, um, been kind of following the various interviews I've been doing, where I mentioned Charlie, <clears throat> and he would like me to come on uh, his podcast and, and talk about Charlie. But one of the things that um, I think I want to clarify from the very beginning is I have no interest whatsoever in um furthering the myth of charlie manson it uh you know perpetuating you know that that uh image if you will that um um the media created so you know really when we're talking about charlie we're talking about the real deal uh is what it comes down to right and um it's based on, you know, the 10 years that I spent with him. And, um, uh, you know, I've openly made reference to Charlie as um, being a punk. Correct. Um, and, I, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really need um, clarification, but the issue is, is that I mean that literally. And so I'm using, I guess, prison jargon. Um, to make reference to Charlie in, in that capacity. Um, you know, but he was more than that. He was um, also a pedophile. And um, while I don't have um, any issue with uh, the former, uh, the latter uh, does cause me concern. Of course. You know, you know one of the experiences that um, um, I had with uh, Charlie was the extraordinary amount of mail that he received and um he received a lot of that mail from youngsters and um he didn't take it upon himself to respond to any of that mail um but i did particularly when he would bring mail to me from youngsters that um were susceptible and so I would, um, I would write letters back to him um, on Charlie's behalf. I mean, I would tell them who I was. Right. So how did you get, yeah. how did you get in that position to you? How did you form that relationship to a point where he's starting to bring you, started to bring you his mail um, and you're writing back on behalf of him. So you were, you were in the know with the type of uh, uh, what's it called? The mail that he was receiving. Yeah. The thing about, um, Charlie was, he had um, a learning disability, um, just as I do. I'm dyslexic. Um, so his problem was comprehension. You know, a lot of people credit uh, a lot of what Charlie had to say with um, just uh, thoughts that were off the top of his head. But uh, the thing about Charlie was that pretty much, particularly when he was addressing a camera or a microphone, um, Everything that he said was choreographed. He had like mm, skits or um, various themes that he used, that he actually practiced um, for a given scenario. So if you look at any of the interviews with Charlie, you don't really see any spontaneous thought. Um, you see a lot of uh, jibber jabber and um, abstraction. And um, that was the reason for that, was because um, he didn't really have a lot of original thoughts. He would sit and he would think things out relative to how he was going to address 
um, someone that was interviewing him in the media. Um, but go back and look at those interviews. And it's very rare that you get a direct answer from Charlie on any question that is germane to the question being asked. Um, and pretty much everybody just accepted that as Charlie. But, um, you know, the relationship that, that we developed, and it probably goes a lot deeper than people might imagine. Um, mm -hmm. Simply because I didn't like Charlie didn't mean that um, I didn't treat him as a human being. I did. Um, you know, I helped him set up a nonprofit um, yeah. that dealt with um, environmental issues. Um, you know, there were a lot of things. He was interested in native ceremonies. So, you know, never in all my years of uh, walking the red road have I denied anyone uh, access to um, that spirituality, that connection to the earth or great mystery or whatever it may have been. And um, that included Charlie. We did quite a few ceremonies together. Um, whether or not he was able to take them in um, is anyone's guess. You know, that's Fair. not for me to assess or for me to judge, really. But um, what years were you with? What years were you around Charlie when he was locked up? Well, our initial. Um, passing and it really was nothing more than a passing was in the 70s at old Folsom okay. um, but uh, when we started actually living in the same unit together uh, that was in 1992 gotcha and we spent uh, 10 years together in that unit and uh, as a matter of fact he 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 died in that unit he passed over while he was still in that unit and this is um, Corcoran Yes. Okay. Because I'm, I'm from Bakersfield. I know he had gotten transported to Bakersfield whenever he did die. Right. Okay. Well, then you know that, uh, um, what's Corcoran? About um, two hours from there? Oh, yeah. If if that. It's all, all those prisons. There's a few of them up there between Bakersfield and Fresno. Little no man's mm -hmm. land type area. I was curious, because mm -hmm. you, yeah. you had said about the uh, kind of everything he did is a little bit more planned out and premeditated. Because that's why I was curious about what the years you were locked up with him was, because he didn't do any interviews for something like 12, 15 years whenever he was first arrested. Uh, so do you think that that was mm -hmm. like a choice on the media, a choice on him? Or do you think that was him trying to kind of, I guess, for lack of a better word, develop the character more? No, I think it actually had a lot to do with the Department of Corrections policy on interviews. Um, under Pete Wilson, uh, the department uh, was not allowed to conduct interviews with uh, inmates unless it was for a specific purpose. In other words, whereas Charlie had been interviewed one-on-one um, -on -one by um, the media, uh, when Pete Wilson enacted that particular law, uh, it was no longer pre permitted. So I think the, the the law that you're talking about had more to do with the change in the law as it relates to the interview of inmates. Um, they made exceptions, and those exceptions occurred uh, usually, uh, like I did a, a National Geographic uh, piece back in 2007. And, um, you know, that had to be approved through headquarters in Sacramento, um, specifically because of that rule. Um, so that you didn't see interviews occurring for that reason. Do you think, was that law, did that have anything to do with him? Because he was, I guess, one of the more high profile people at the time and they saw him, I mean kind of as a danger because like you're saying all these kids who are writing you letters they're going to tune in and be like oh i want to be you know tex watson or linda kasabian any of these mm. dummies right <laughs> right yeah i actually think it did have a lot to do with uh with charlie and others um so it was the, the notoriety associated with these individuals and i think the influence the objection was that 
um, the prisoners were being given a form, um, you know, that was certainly true in the case of Charlie, um, insofar as their philosophy or their, their specific views. So what the new law um, allowed for was um, it had to be specifically related to something that the department would approve, uh, whether it be gangs or, uh, you know, um, something along uh, prison reform, um, something going on with the legislature. Pretty boring stuff, actually, but um, that's why they did that. Uh, and I, and to answer your question, Bruce, I, I do think that it had a lot to do with Charlie and um, others in his situation. But I can't think of another prisoner that had the notoriety that Charlie did, perhaps other than Sirhan. And Sirhan, Sirhan was there with us, uh, as was Juan Corona and, you know, the trash bag killer and a few others. But I think the problem was, you know, you had the son of Sam Law, uh, that was um, introduced at one point in time. I mean, it was the first one was overturned. And um, so the legislature reenacted uh, what they now call Son of Sam Law 2. And uh, the idea is, is to prevent uh, prisoners from profiting from the crimes. And um, that's still in effect. So... Um, you know, Charlie and others in his situation, but particularly Charlie, made astronomical amounts of money um, through selling memorabilia and um, at one point, I think, even his clothes. So, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. I can remember him receiving, um, what was it, 1099s? Is that the independent contractor? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I can remember him receiving um, tax receipts in excess of $100,000 for memorabilia and uh, other things, photographs that he would autograph. Um, it was big money. Um, Who was facilitating all of this? Was it what, like just kind of some, like Squeaky From or somebody like that, that kind of one of the people who... Well, Squeaky was locked up in, I think, Florida at the time. And, and uh, you know, he would talk to her on the phone. And I talked to her myself. And, um, but, um, so she, most of his dealings had to do with uh, Sandra Good at that time. Um, Sandra Good uh, moved to Hanford, which is very near Corcoran. And um, so while she herself, I believe at one point was not allowed to visit Charlie. What she would do is she would recruit um, individuals that would come in and visit Charlie. And then there were other people that, that uh, were brought into his um, family setting. And uh, as long as they were able to pass the, um, the background check, then they were allowed to come in and visit him. So he did receive visits. Uh, photographs were taken um, on the yard, um, and then he would autograph those, send those out, and those would be sold. Uh, so his memorabilia um, brought in a lot of money. Did you find him coherent? Like, like, was there a difference between him on camera and him off camera as far as the the like logic of his sentences yeah, like being he, able to put a sentence yeah. together and not. Yeah. In other words, was he lucid? Mm. Yes. Lucid. That's yeah. exactly yeah. what I was looking for. Yeah. He had, he had moments of, of being lucid. Um, but um, sometimes I think he would just get caught up. I mean, he was very big into his hashish and his marijuana and his uh, hallucinogenics. And he had all of those in the unit. And, um, but, um, his music was very important to him. Um, what did you think of his music <laughs> personally? Well, I didn't care for it. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> not something that I would go out and buy. Yeah. You know, he fancied himself a musician and a singer. And, um, 
I, I, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's, I've talked to Brian about this before. I don't think it's the worst music I've ever heard in my life, but it is no. he, he, everything about him from his like slang, the way he talks, all of his music because he was in jail pretty much his entire childhood. It's all like 15, mm-hmm. 20 years behind. So by the time he got out, he's still making like a Bob, uh, Bob Dylan ripoff kind of music and everyone else has already moved on to, uh, you know, can't yeah. hate or whoever they were yeah. listening to at the time. <laughs> yeah. He was stuck in a specific era. Yeah. I, uh, as it relates to music and, and the lyrics associated with that, those, uh, that music, you know, the songs, but, um, like I said, I'm not, um, uh, a musician, um, and, and certainly don't qualify as a, a critic, um, mm. of what is good and, and what isn't. Uh, I think the um, the public makes that determination, but um, I was never impressed by his um, his music. There's a lot of tangents. Uh, I'm trying not to derail this podcast with, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, with Sirhan Sirhan and Charles Manson being in the same prison, it's a hell of a handball team. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I have questions about Sirhan Sirhan, but my more pressing question is: I'm familiar with ADX Florence, and that being the supermax prison where all the like, like mm-hmm. El Chapo's there, nine 11 terrorists are there and all that stuff. It mm-hmm. seems like that's where Manson and, and Sirhan Sirhan would be. So what does it take to get into <laughs> Florence? It's probably more great. Well, I think, uh, yeah, you're talking about, uh, with the individuals you're talking about, um, that's an entirely different level of prisoner, um, by way of intelligence, by way of the, uh, capacity and the ability for violence uh, to control situations and circumstances. I mean, um, when you're talking about Sirhan or Charlie, you're not talking about individuals who um, were in control of their environment, were in control really of the resources outside of their environment. Right. Um, that makes total. I could have figured that but, out. Yeah. You know, the individuals you're talking about are um, what I would consider uh, forces to be reckoned with. And uh, neither Charlie nor Sirhan um, fit that bill at all. Um, Did you find Sirhan so Sirhan to be more... lucid? What's that? Did you find Sirhan Sirhan to be lucid? Because I know that you know there's a lot of conspiracy theories about him being like in the MK Ultra program and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, yeah, I understand that uh, there's talk about um, the onset of dementia as it relates to him and, and um, you know, how that works perhaps in, in, in later years. I mean, I had um, many conversations with Sir Han where he was quite lucid and um, uh, quite articulate in so far as his beliefs philosophically and otherwise. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I think Sir Han actually fancied himself um an intellectual. Um, I wouldn't uh, place him in that category. <laughs> so you were, when you saying by the time that you, cause you said you guys had kind of passing in the seventies, by the time that you got to be around Charlie on a more regular basis, was there more like, was he kind of, uh, I guess settled down more in a sense, or was there any moment where you had to tell him like, Hey, you're, heebie-jeebie mind control shit isn't going to work on me. So <laughs> don't try to talk backwards to me or whatever you're trying to do. That was, that was never an issue. Uh, to give you an example, they moved. Uh, I was in the restricted housing unit. There was only six of us there and we were all um, former gang leaders. And uh, so they moved the restricted housing unit from to Hatchby. It was the only unit of its kind in the state of California. It was actually in the penal code. Um, so that, for instance, they took my name from me and I was occupant E. Now, I still had my B number, um, as did the other individuals in the unit, but all of us were classified occupant and uh, I was occupant E. So when I went to the unit at Corcoran, it opened in 1992, um, Charlie and Sirhan were both living in Soledad. They had a protective housing unit there. And, um, you know, there was actually two units. There were that many people. 
but only uh, Charlie, Sirhan Sirhan, Juan Corona, and a few other individuals uh, were actually transferred to the new unit in Corcoran, along with those of us that came from the restricted housing unit. So in total, um, maybe 10, um, 11, 12 maximum in the unit itself. Um, so um, it was a specialized unit. And um, I was there before, well, no, I wasn't. I'll take that back. Uh, Charlie and the others were there before we were transferred. They shut down the restricted housing unit. The idea was to consolidate. And there was only one unit like this of its kind in the state of California. So um, there was a vetting process that uh, had to occur. So when I did arrive, I remember that um, they assigned me a cell. And Charlie was just a few cells down from me. And so I was standing in the doorway of my cell. And Charlie came out of his cell and he walked over to me and he just walked up to me and he laid his head on my chest. Um, and that uh, was a form of submission. Um, yeah, especially in jail. And, I feel like if you do that, you're you're really giving it up. Yeah. <laughs> so clearly he knew who you uh, were before you arrived there. Right? Yes. Got it. Yeah. And, and obviously you know who he was. So what was your initial reaction and feeling when that, when that occurred, he, he just walked up into your cell, a little funky. No, it's not a typical, typical thing he to occur. Didn't walk up into my cell. I was standing, you know, no, I was standing in the cell doorway. Okay. Got it. In the frame the cell door was open and he saw me and walked over and, and, um, you know, like I said, placed his head on, on my chest and I recognized it for what it was. Um, you know, um, didn't really make anything of it other than to acknowledge it and to simply tell Charlie that it was all right. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, uh, Charlie being under the protection of the Aryan Brotherhood and, um, you know, there's some truth to that, uh, not a lot because he was in the the hole at Folsom with the brand. And I hear a lot of talk about Kenny Como uh, as if Kenny Como was Aryan Brotherhood. Um, he wasn't. Right. Um, but I, I see a lot of people putting that out there that, um, you know, Kenny Como did have a, a stable of girls that uh, ran uh, fraudulent um, credit cards for him. And um, I remember that uh, Kenny Como and Charlie got into a, what I referred to as a slap fest on the the, the yard in Old Folsom, because uh, it sure as hell wasn't a fight. Right. Um, neither knew anything about fighting. How big is how big is slap. this? Uh, how big is the Como guy? Because Charlie's about four feet tall. Yeah, he 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 wasn't much bigger than Charlie. Um, Featherweight match. Average right. average size. You know, Charlie was actually smaller than the average man. Um, but, uh, Kenny wasn't, uh, much bigger. Um, I think oftentimes what happens is that, uh, people in general confuse Kenny Como with Kenny Wilkes. Kenny Wilkes was a member of the brand and he was at old Folsom and, uh, we called him old folks and, um, he eventually did parole and, um, died on the streets. But at any rate, um, so Kenny and, and, uh, Charlie got involved in this slap fest. And this was over the fact that Kenny had recruited some of Charlie's girls and was using them um, in this um, credit card fraud. Um, and the issue really wasn't so much that uh, Kenny was using his girls. It was that uh, Charlie didn't feel that he was getting his cut mm. um, or from the proceeds from that. So, uh, You know, coming from that, um, two years later, uh, seeing Charlie at uh, Corcoran, um, there really was no change there. Um, I never did consider Charlie um, very assertive right. in his perspective. 
It's, inter- um, it's interesting uh, hearing all this. At the beginning of the episode, what I took uh, as to what you said was I want to kind of smash the the narrative or the the, the perception or myth of Char- Charlie Manson. And Bruce, Bruce is up in here. I feel like he knows he's here in front of the show and also because he knows much more than me about this mm-hmm. topic. And the what 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 I'm curious to know what what your perspective is because I want to I want to hear what his perspective on who he is and I want I want to attack those types of things like like who Charlie yeah yeah like before oh. walking into this interview like in your mind who is he to you Tim I think he's like he's not not that he's not a smart guy even though he is very dumb he got arrested for a, like he got ten years in prison for like trying to cash like a fake $42 treasury check. Like he's a really stupid guy. I like think he's done. Like he also, that's why I was interested earlier. Whenever you said that he had was LSD in his, uh, uh, cell, because my opinion was that he would, was good at finding these people that were most of them, I guess, missing a father figure, but also missing a lot of other shit in their life. And he's just kind of dosing them up with LSD and he's, starts out as this thing is like we're pre- playing pretend well he's not really doing any lsd but it's like if you gather 10 people who are all you know on acid you can kind of tell them what to do for the most part like sure. that so like even when they go out to the movie ranch and they're all just really playing pretend and acting out like they're making old westerns like doing all this stuff and then ended up whenever he got caught it was because there was one of the people that was involved in the thing and the murders was just talking about it too much in jail. It wasn't like they went straight to him. He was, they were in jail for stealing cars and going out in death Valley. But mm-hmm. I think he was just a uh, kind of, uh, I mean, he was a guy who was born, you know, his mom was like a 16 year old prostitute who didn't have a name for like the first two months mm-hmm. of his literally on his birth certificate. I'm pretty sure it said no name right. on his thing. So like he was kind of in trouble from the beginning a little bit, but he's, Real, especially being in LA and being in the entertainment industry and meeting these people, he's just kind of a bitter guy. That's toward. I mean, really, just mm-hmm. seems like he's a bitter guy that his shitty music never got made. Yeah, and so he's like, "Well, yeah. let me, you know, enact this whole thing." Like, uh, his whole race war idea was just far fetched and probably some shitty made up on the spot that people on acid believed. I don't think he believed any of it. I think he just wanted towards it. By the end of it, he was just bitter that his music didn't get made, and it seemed like nothing was going to happen. So he's like. Let's do something. Right. And and it's interesting you say yeah. that. And the limited knowledge that I have of him, he seems like he's apparently this fascinating, influential, controlling, manipu- like master manipulative type of individual. And so now to get the context here, starting off saying that uh, he's a punk and he's a pedophile and things like that is things that you don't typically hear. How, 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 I guess going to, if, if yeah, the, yeah. your first interaction back to you with him is, is him with the act of submission. You're, I think you're a pretty smart yeah. dude. How long did it f- take you to figure out that, hey, there might be, I'm not even saying sure that you did figure this out. I'm just assuming here because this is what I would do. Figure out, I got a hustle here. I can, I can really get something <laughs> yeah. out of this. How long did it take you to figure out that I could, I can run some, run, run some sort of game to improve my, 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 I mean, I think you already had a good stature, but maybe your financial situation. Make some money off these Charlie Manson t-shirts. Yeah. Get the merch most, game. Yeah. Most people actually think that way, you know, right. but with that there are consequences even in the joint Mm. and so you know you're looking at more and i looked at it this way relative to charlie's resources as opposed to uh, making bank off of his memorabilia or anything else associated with that sure what was uh, far more valuable um were his resources and he had those you know you want to remember that when you talk about hallucinogenics and lysergic acid particularly you know you go back to the 60s and, um, you know, the, the mindset, if you will, and the type of lysergic acid that was available then, you know, Timothy Leary, who was around, um, same time down at Woodland Canyon drive. Um, you know, when you went to, if you did at all, went to see uh, Timothy at, um, his place on Woodland Canyon drive, you walked into his house and he had a glass bowl of, um, uh, thousands of hits of lysergic acid. And, um, you know, people would just walk in and lick their finger and stick it in the bowl and lick it off. And, you know, there's only, you can only get it so loaded from lysergic acid. It has its limits relative to that. Um, but my point in mentioning that is that Charlie was of that era, you know, the utilization of uh, hallucinogenics, 
towards the manipulation of people. Mm -hmm. um, not to suggest that Timothy was doing that. Um, his focus was something entirely different. Actually, a brilliant man. Um, but in Charlie's case, you know, he hooked up with um, teenagers, um, primarily women, who um, had their own problems. And he utilized um, hallucinogenics, um, essentially to control, you know, what they thought and how they thought it. Um, right. And that had more to do with his storytelling um, than anything else. I mean, um, was he a manipulator? Of course he was. Master manipulator? I don't put him in that category. Right. I've, I've known a few master manipulators uh, in my time, and um, he doesn't qualify. So, um, I would imagine a master you know, he, manipulator wouldn't require drugs to manipulate. Mm. Well, that's my thinking also, Bruce, is that if you are a master manipulator, then you're not using in any capacity because of, um, you know, what it does to, um, alter not only your consciousness, but your, your perception of reality. Um, you know, I've never used drugs myself for that reason. And um, oh, uh, I can I can remember when the um, idea of myself being a master manip manipulator started. You know, right. it goes back many, many years, and it's not something that you're really ever able to shake um, in any capacity. So it depends on your your motives as it relates to manipulation, you know, manipulation is a two way sword, it slices both ways. If, if your intent is to infringe upon the rights of others, as it relates to their humanity, then that should be perceived as negative. But you know, one of my favorite um, psychotherapists, um, Milton Erickson, who wrote a book called My Voice Will Go With You, um, he was very fond of saying that we all manipulate, even as children, we manipulate our parents and so on. Um, and so we're all manipulators. The difference is, is that, um, and, you know, I run a nonprofit, so I'm constantly attempting to persuade people to uh, contribute, uh, to become a part of, to volunteer, and that's a form of manipulation. So politicians do it all the time. Um, but the point is, is that it's your intent. If um, you're attempting to persuade with the intent of infringing upon another human being's uh, rights, then I, I believe that should be negative manipulation. And that was the case with Charlie. Yeah. Um, he knew what he was doing, and he knew how he was doing it, and he knew the effect that it was having, and he knew the control that he had. You know, he was a petty thief. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure that he would qualify as a convict back in the, back in the day um no he's like yeah a check forger and a car thief and like low level yeah, yeah he very much so yeah he took his skill set that he learned in prison and gave that application to naive really um innocent girls um yeah. who and if you think about the era of the 60s and and that's easy for me to do because i was there in the 60s um you see how they wanted something different. There was a lot of upheaval um, in our society back in the 60s, not the least of which was the, the Vietnam War. And, and um, you know, you had the hippie generation and, and uh, you know, peace, love, spare change, hate Ashbury. And, uh, you know, Charlie fit right into that. Um, right. He did. And, and um, but... Um, he used it, essentially. He used the image of it. He used the um, um, the drugs that were available at the time, particularly the hallucinogenics, um, to control a group of youngsters um, that really didn't um, have the mind development up to that point, the maturation, if you will, the life experience um, to combat it. So it's no different to me than, you know, the uh, Jim Jones situation yeah. mm -hmm. um you know the cult um scenario where you have a what the followers perceived to be a dynamic leader and i don't doubt that um charlie's family perceived him as a dynamic leader well, they had to they One killed for him he, for sure right 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 
Mm-hmm. He's charismatic yeah. I mean, really more than anything. It's just those people and not, not all of them were even like, I don't think any of them were as, uh, I mean, as far as their life goes, was as, were as fucked up as him because his life from the beginning mm-hmm. was messed up. A lot of these people in the thing, like if you start looking into their backgrounds or reading about them, it's like Tex Watson was like a all American football player from Texas. Like a lot of these people were like had pretty normal upbringings. They were all just very sheltered. It was like that, you know, late forties through the fifties, early sixties, like sheltered Mm -hmm. family life where, and then, you know, their family parents divorce, whatever. So they come out here or they're already out here and they're looking for something or somebody. And the first guy who it is, is Charlie. And he's loading you up with LSD and mixing it with speed and telling you all kinds of other fun stuff. And you're like, Oh, this is acceptance. Yeah. New ideas. Yeah. A little, little wild. These people are sheltered. I don't Probably even having sex for the first time, shit like that. Yeah. I wouldn't even call him charismatic. Mm. So that's something I've learned like through comedy and the entertainment industry is that a lot of people yeah. who are just comfortable being weird or shucking norms, societal norms, no matter how incoherent or like what people just are gravitating, they gravitate yeah, that towards that. But I, sense. when I watch him, I don't see any charisma. Yeah. That's what trips me out because it's how did, how does this man to this day, it's like he influences pop culture. And, and then, then you hear the, and then you hear this side of the coin here. Yeah. And it's like, he's a pedophile. You said something, yeah. you said primarily he messed with young women. So that means on the sense, secondary nature, he liked to mess with young boys as well. That's what I took by you saying that you could clear that up. Well, what he did was he would take the children, the offspring, if you will, of those women when they had offspring and they were actually very young when they did. And then it was their offspring um, mm. that he molested. And, um, you know, I, I say that not from speculation or conjecture, on my part, but I walked into the visiting room uh, one day and actually caught him in the act and um, took it upon myself to terminate his visit. Um, but, you know, you make some really good points here about, you know, the charisma. No, he was not uh, in any way charismatic um, uh, in the normal sense of the word. Um, again, it goes back to the times. You know, if you stop and think about the very thing that we're, we are talking about right now, as it relates to cults and, and the ability uh, through um, really hatred, you, know, you go back to the hippie era and it was all, all supposed to be about uh, peace, love and spare change, but that's not what Charlie was advocating. He was actually yeah. advocating hatred. Um, right. And so, you know, you fast forward to present day, uh, you know, many decades later, and we're actually seeing the same thing reoccur um, through the influence of these youngsters via the internet mm-hmm. or via these groups. And, uh, you know, they're going out and they're doing the bidding of these individuals, um, like these recent shootings. Um, where, you know, where individuals go into a church and they, they essentially execute 10 people. And uh, they do that because... Uh, In my opinion, they've been brainwashed. And, you know, that brainwashing, the source of that brainwashing is hatred. Right. Um, So I think it's important to make that distinction, particularly as it relates to Charlie. He was not peace, love, spare change hippie that was advocating love, free love, um, or love ends. He was advocating hatred and isolation. He isolated his group for that reason. And um, so... You know, the idea of propaganda, you know, I've referred to Charlie in the past as being a jawjacker. Right. And um, he, he was a jawjacker, but, you know, so was Hitler. Hitler was the quintessential jawjacker. Hmm. But it's that jawjacking via hatred um, that um, gives them their form. And so, you know, the real issue is, and I think as a society, what we need to look at is, you know, how does this happen and why does it happen? Right. And I think a lot more emphasis needs to be placed on that. We can use Charlie as an example in going back to the 60s and the influence that he had over these youngsters and how that facilitated his agenda, his personal agenda, his, if you will, narcissistic agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, it has real application by way of a pattern that appears to be constantly repeated in our society by individuals, Charlie only being one of them. 
um, to where we are today in so far as the challenge that faces our society relative to these hate groups and um, how they're influencing um, at-risk youth to do their bidding. Um, it's nothing short of cowardly. And that also applies to Charlie. Right. You see, he was a coward. He was a coward. With all that being said, was there, I guess, prior, you, you were initially arrested after he was initially arrested and put away for that crime. Is that correct? Is that timeline correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So was there at any point in time ever some sort of allure that you had, uh, kind of similar to how... I'd say general pop culture sees there's a certain alert to him, a certain idea of him before you started having your perspective change. And if so, and you did, at what point in time did that perspective change in regards to the way you saw and thought about him? Yeah, that's a great question, Mason, but it really doesn't have application uh, to my own journey. Um, mm. You know, I never gave, uh, back in the 60s, um, it isn't to say that I didn't have occasional contact with hippies or right. with individuals who were using hallucinogenics or were into the drug scene and the dropout scene. Like I said, I met Timothy Leary a number of times, but that was only because where he was staying was on the borderline of our ranch. So when I would take the cattle over the mountain into the lower pasture, I'd ride on a little bit and, and uh, you know, you run across a lot of folks, good folks. Right. And uh, by my estimation, Timothy was one of them. But, you know, if you keep going, you, go, you get down into Laguna Beach. And Laguna Beach was a, a haven, if you will, for um, some amazingly talented artists. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's being able to separate, if you will, um, segments of our society uh, toward understanding what was going on with them and why. In my case, um, you know, I was... Uh, riding the rodeo circuit, bull riding, working on a horse ranch. Um, so I had no construct in my head about Charlie or anybody else of that ilk. Right. Um, so that in coming to prison, um, that remained so. Um, I didn't watch TV. Um, so in the course of my life, I mean, the first time I watched really TV was my last year of incarceration after 45 years. Okay. And you know, so, um, what'd you get you know, into? I, I tell that. <laughs> the bachelor. What that? I said, what'd you, what'd you, whenever you finally turned it on, what'd you get into? <laughs> oh, well, actually I did. You know, my wife bought me the television because she insisted that, uh, I learned something about what reality was in society. Mm. And, um, so I turned it on and, um, I remember being most touched by a commercial. I don't even remember the commercial. I just remember that it was touching to me. But the so-called reality shows and all this, it just seemed um, like nonsense. It must have been a lot to process, but, um, man. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it is, yeah. It and still is, uh, truth be told. Um, when you, you know, said that... My biggest oh, I'm sorry, please go on. No, no, that's all right. Sorry, the Ask delay can be hard. I was, I was curious because you said that whenever you would have contact with some of the uh, the hippie folks back then, from what I've read is that Charlie kind of caught this tail end of all that of like because he was in jail for like I have something eight or nine years for that. We were talking about that mm -hmm. check, forty two dollar check that he got locked up for. Did you see the turn in kind of the peace and love thing switching over because? A lot of people have said that once kind of speed got introduced into the picture, that a lot of these hippies had kind of like turned evil a little bit towards like the end of the 60s. And so like, even though not saying that Charlie brought all this on, but like these crimes happening was kind of the personification of the whole thing of like, this was about peace and love. But now these people are, you know, even though they're spelling some of the words well, wrong, yeah. writing and blood on the wall. <laughs> right. I think uh, Charlie was an opportunist. And he saw an opportunity in what was going on to further his own gain and goals. I mean, not the least of which was his music and, um, you know, his singing. And uh, we all know the story about the Beach Boys and how that didn't bode well with Brian Wilson. And uh, Brian Wilson wasn't impressed from what I understand. 
And um, on a personal level, nor was I. But I'm no, I'm no, certainly no Brian Wilson, so I don't have the discernment, you know, to make that distinction. I just simply didn't like his singing. But um, yeah, I think, you know, going back to the idea of him being an opportunist and, and the times again, uh, there was a lot of upheaval, there was a lot of change occurring. You know, when you, when you come up out of the 50s, um, it was a different uh, America in the 50s. And then, uh, you know, we hit the 60s and you can see the change gradually occurring. And, you know, you know, a lot of that had to do with um, advancements in technology, um, not the least of which was television and, and uh, radio and, you know, everything that goes along with it. I mean, somebody who was it? Um, it was one of the uh, deputy sheriffs I knew in Los Angeles. Um, great guy. Uh, he worked as a um, detective with homicide. And I remember, well, it's been a few decades now, but um, I had someone get in touch with him. And so he got back to me and he was talking about his pager and that he couldn't live without his pager. And I didn't know what the hell a pager was, hmm. um, nor did I care. But um, it just goes to show you that uh, as technology evolved and it evolved very very quickly you know it started to change the very makeup of our society and i'm i'm not a, a luddite i i i um have a great appreciation for technology and it's its value um towards particularly education point is is that uh um you know charlie came up as you correctly point out he missed a lot of that but he was an opportunist, so he took advantage of it. And uh, unfortunately, he took advantage of it very effectively. Um, you know, if you just stop and think about the, the crime associated with uh, Sharon Tate, right. you know, and cutting her child out of her belly, um, you know, it doesn't yeah. get any more atrocious than nah. that. They strung her up on the ceiling like a pinata. Did they really? I didn't know all that. I have a question because I, I luckily my experience with prison and jail is like you know one night, uh, three different times uh, for. That's not, a blessing. Yes, yeah. I, but you didn't get any TV in there either. No, so hundred percent agree. <laughs> Respect your time, dude. But yeah. with right. one of the, I don't know if I want to say cliche stereotypes, whatever. One of the things that uh, your I was fed was that um, like people who do what like Charlie's doing to kids in prison they get handled mm -hmm. uh, or, or killed or whatever. That's like kind of the, what you're told out here. Uh, you learn that in one night. In jail. No, no, I'm saying, <laughs> I was just saying that, that's saying that, that I have no experience with yeah. jail. That was, that was yeah. my qualifier. So everything I know is from the outside uh, or I not know what I assume or what I've been told. Right. So like, I mean, knowing this about him and knowing like what the stereotype of prison is like, was he not uh, put into like a special popular? Well, I guess you already were in one. How was it handled? I guess is my question. Mm. Sorry, that took me a long time. It's okay. Yeah, okay. you're talking about uh, in his case, Sirhan's case, Juan Corona's case, um, the perception of the atrocity of their crimes. Um, meant that they typically would not survive in prison in a general population. Right. So, in fact, I, you know, you, just, most people know the just for about, murder? Because I mean specifically the kid, like, the, yeah, the kids the molesting, the child molesters. Like, people yeah. always talk about, like, child molesters get killed in prison. Yes, that's true. It is? Um, yes, it remains true. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, it, um, and it depends on where you're at and, and you know, what people will tolerate uh, based on what's coming their way. If um, you've got a bag man, and Charlie was a bag man, in other words, he had connections, so he, he held the bag, he held drugs. So you have people who use drugs, so they're willing to overlook um, his crime. Interesting. So it's not um, as principled as even, I've been told. It had a price yeah. on it. Yeah, it, it's see, that's really what it comes down to is if if there's something in it for them, then they're willing to overlook that. And, you know, I'm I'm guilty of that myself, um, you know, insofar as talking about, well, you know, 
Charlie's got these resources, so I'll use these resources toward the benefit of the brand. And right. that was actually done. I did that. Right. Um, but it's in his best interest to keep that shit coming or else if not, you're it's if that shit runs out, he's, you know, probably not going to yeah, be in a good spot. Uh, you know, it's like anything else. I mean, you have to ascertain the value of um, whatever you're dealing with, particularly within a controlled environment, because resources are scarce. And so that if your effort is to control those resources, uh, then you're going to compromise um, even the perception of your integrity. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can project this idea that you're, you're a warrior society and that, um, you know, what you're about has um, a code of ethics and uh, even honor, you know, associated with it, um, you know, based on your, your various uh, confrontations within the prison setting. But all that goes out the window when you use the example I just gave relative to utilizing Charlie's resources to the benefit of the group. Um, so there's something um, you mentioned before and you keep mentioning the resources I wanted to bring up. I got a giggle out of it the yeah. first time you saw it, but I, you, you said it, but it, it's still, it's very interesting. You said, I took his girls. I said, I, I took Charlie when you were in prison with him, you took his girls. This is, this is correct. What, yeah. what type of resource were they and how did you end up uh, obtaining that resource from Charles Manson? Well, it was just really by way of introduction. It um, Much of what I did um, at the time, my alma mater is Berkeley. And, um, you know, that was after I taught myself to read and write. But um, most of these girls, these resources I'm talking about were students at Berkeley. And um, very intelligent young women. Um, right. But they were also associated with another organization called Tribal Thumb, which was very radical, very militant. And um, so what, what they were after, however, because you want to remember, we're still in the 70s here, is they were after a commune. They, they embraced an egalitarian type um, social structure. Um, one of equality between men and women, and that um, I won't go too deep into the egalitarian aspects, but they were they were really interested in creating a commune, and um, there were different things that they wanted to build on that commune that um, I had experience in. So it was really an exchange. They wanted something, and I wanted something. So we set up a meeting, and they came to Old Folsom to see me, and. Um, you know, I tapped into that militancy, you know, on their part and anti-establishment on their part. Um, and that was very big at that time, you know, amongst the Black Panthers, the BGF, the the um, Sibonese Liberation Army. And I was with all of them at Folsom. All the leaders of those specific groups were at Folsom with me um, at that time. So I tapped into that with these girls relative to what I wanted. And what I wanted was them to smuggle we weapons into the institution for me. And so we had meetings and um, I had to figure out how to beat metal detect detectors first. And I did. Um, and so, but I had them test those for me at San Francisco airport. Sure. So once we did that, then I had them smuggle buck knives into Old Folsom for me. And they did that. And if you stop and think about it, that that took um, a lot of courage on their part. Yeah, I would, uh, yeah, I'm gonna agree. Left that out of yeah. the song, Johnny Cash. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but I mean, it, and and again, you know, that too, you know, I've I've um, I've ragged on Charlie for, you know, manipulating people and being an opportunist. But you know, I fit that category also, you know, relative to what we're talking about here in the context of. Of using they wanted something from me i wanted something from them so there was an exchange a trade-off yeah. and uh i was willing to engage that to get what i needed inside prison which was superior weaponry for the purposes of um, violence right and um, you know i did that uh, they i taught them how to smuggle them in they did bring them in i brought them in and i used them uh, against um you know my opponents my enemies um in prison um, see, that goes far beyond anything that Charlie ever imagined doing. Right. Um, 
See, that wasn't his get down um, ever in any capacity. Um, mm -hmm. But in so far as intelligence goes, the women were, by my estimation, far more intelligent than than uh, Charlie ever thought about being. Um, particularly when they came into their own. And by that, I mean, when they began to mature and understand um, what was happening and why it was happening. Um, I'm a little so they, jumbled. You know, Charlie on Charlie Lodge. What are you jumbled mm -hmm. on? I'm jumbled on the timeline. When when was this? Mm. When was the weapon smuggling? Because I remember in an earlier episode, I think it, you had spent a significant amount of time in prison nonviolently. Right, right. right. You did. swore off violence. Well, yeah. You want to remember, Brian, that um, prison is violence in and of itself. Being incarcerated, Boy. anytime that you take a human being and put him in a cage. And you've had that experience. That's uh, perpetrating violence upon that person, um, no matter how you slice it. So, um, the time frame here is the seventies, uh, the yeah. latter part, latter part of that decade. I mean, I think I was transferred from Old Folsom to San Quentin in seventy-eight. Could have been the next year, but I do believe it was seventy-eight. And I was transferred primarily because of my violent, violent activities. Mm -hmm. um, but we were all engaged in that. And by all, I mean all the groups. Um, you know, you, we hear about a lot about racism and otherwise, but it had nothing to do with racism, it had nothing to do with white supremacy, any more than the Black Guerrilla family or the Black Panthers were interested in, in Black supremacy, or the Mexican Mafia was interested in, in Mexican supremacy. It was about controlling your resources. You lived in a controlled environment. It was under the most oppressive circumstances that anyone can possibly imagine. And so uh, you were doing everything that you could to improve your status within that environment by way of being able to live, to function, um, let alone the idea of humanity. Let that go. That becomes irrelevant. Uh, the sense of one's humanity. I mean, the uh, compromise as to one's sense of humanity um, is constantly uh, forfeited uh, as a result of being incarcerated. Um, so, um, so you gave yourself quite the advantage in, in, in improve the quality of life by utilizing his women. If they're bringing you buck knives and they have prison shanks, I'm sure that obviously other than you knowing how to fight and being a large individual that certainly improved things, correct? Well, you need to understand that violence is currency. And yeah. so the better able you are to facilitate um, and affect that violence, um, the greater your standing, your power base, if you will. And that's what you're all striving for, is an economic power base. Right. And the currency associated with that is violence. So the possession, if you will, of street knives, buck knives, folding buck knives, and of course, you beat the metal detector, so now you're keistering these, Right. And so you're carrying them everywhere you go. I think, um, you know, one of the write ups I, I did, yeah, that's right, I did. In San Quentin, I was busted with a buck knife, um, only because I'd made the journey up from Chino to San Quentin in the bus ride. And so while I would, would have been normally able to beat the x ray machine, uh, I wasn't able to budge this damn thing. So they caught me with it. And, and um, you know, that comes with the territory. But, um, kind of getting off track here, and uh, I yeah, don't really want to do that. Okay. No, no, that's all right. It's all right. I mean, because I, I think it was an important question, the timeline itself. But what's important about it is that it was still the seventies, and there was still yeah. a lot of upheaval going on. You know, it was just a year before that that George Jackson had taken over the Adjustment Center in San Quentin, taken guards hostage, white inmates hostage, uh, cut their throats. Um, and uh, you know George Jackson was killed, but he smuggled a gun into the prison. So you know a lot of up, a lot of upheaval. Um, uh, this may be difficult for some of the viewers to even comprehend. Um, you know how these things would happen in, in within the realm of their experience. This would seem to them absurd, um, right. but I'm here to tell you that it wasn't. You know these were things we're, that were actually right. I I understand like uh, that, yeah, it's like it's hard to understand because like when you told the story of catching Charlie Manson in the act of that, 
in my mind, I initially yeah. right away I judged you for not uh for not just <laughs> killing him right there yeah. on the spot. Yeah. And I think a yeah. lot of viewers are going to. That's why I'm saying it out loud. Fair. Um and well, and I don't blame them. You see, yeah. but what they need to know is it, you know, you again you're dealing with the circumstances. So what I did do is I walked in, I snatched Charlie up, literally, bodily, snatched him up, lifted him up, walked him back out through the the holding area that I just come through and there was a closet there and there was hooks along the wall and I hung them on one of those hooks. <laughs> and I, left there. And, uh, I walked like back in and I told the guard his visits over. Um, right. what was the guard? So, was the guard fine with that or? Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He was fine with that. And, um, you know, but you know, the, you know, I've to take that a step further as a as a counselor, and I am an alcohol and drug counselor as well as a life coach, certified in that. And um, so, you know, I used to run groups before I was paroled, and I worked for the Department of Corrections as an alcohol and drug counselor. Now they called them mentors, but I was actually certified as a counselor, and um, so I would run groups, and I can remember that. You know, the administration came to me uh, because of my work on, on behalf of others and asked me if I would run a group of child molesters, sex yeah. offenders, but child molesters. And I had um, a lot of misgivings about that. But the idea here is, is that if I'm going to stay true to um, my own spiritual walk and, you know, my evolution in my humanity, and uh, that which I advocate in that regard, um, then, you know, the only answer I could give them was yes, I'll, I'll attempt to run the group, no promises. So I did, you know, I, I brought these, these men together. And um, in truth, I didn't last long. Um, you know, and I came away with that with the belief, personal belief, not professional belief, but personal belief that it's a disease of the brain that is incurable. Mm. And um, I was recently asked on another program what I felt about um, sterilization, chemical steril sterilization, as it relates to child molesters. You know, and, you know, these are, these are heavy subjects. Right. Um, but, you know, I really wasn't prepared for the question that was asked, but nonetheless, I answered it to the best of my ability. And I said, I don't think chemical sterilization goes far enough um, mm. because what people don't understand about um, molestation of children is that it's not always about sex. It's about power and control. And oftentimes the same way that they were controlled and power was imposed upon them. Now, that certainly isn't making excuses for them. Right. And that's not my intent here saying that. But this is an extremely complex issue when you're talking about child molesters, but my own evolution in my humanity again, was that uh, I was not going to be judged jury and executioner as it relates to these individuals. Um, I don't have that right. So the best I could do was remove Charlie from that situation. And I did. Right. Um, and then to openly talk about that as I'm doing now. Now, mm -hmm. I understand what you were saying, Brian, when you said that you know, people will be offended that, that I didn't do that. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that, that uh, would have done something physical, but no value in it. You mm -hmm. know, unless you're prepared to kill the individual, then where's the value in the violence? You remove the, the person from the situation, you make staff aware of what's going on so that it doesn't occur again. All right. Um, and perhaps that's been one of my hardest lessons is understanding that we have a system in place that attempts to address this. It doesn't always do so effectively, um, in my opinion. But um, the idea here is that, you know, we have a dialogue as it relates to um, whether it be child molesters or these hate groups um, that have um, been spawned by... Um, in my opinion, what comes down to is a um, mutation mm. in uh, the human condition. 
um, as it relates to what it is to be a human being. That's not an accusation. It's not a judgment on my part. It's an observation um, based on my own sense of what it is to be human. Um, so, you know, and that goes directly to the idea of, of um, elitism and privilege and um, right. a vast array of other factors that um, I think in the future that we should talk about, you know, in these programs and, um, you know, ask people to weigh in. And these are, you know, when we talk about the damage done, we're talking about patterns. We're talking about where does addiction come from? It comes from trauma for the most part. Right. So let's talk, let's talk about those issues. And, you know, child molesters are no different in that capacity. Um, so, you know, it, we can't exclude them from the conversation. You see, because then it's not a holistic conversation. It's a linear conversation. We're only talking about what we want to talk about because it's comfortable. Yeah. It's hard for people to wrap their head about... around that. And and it's hard for people to yeah. want to to help people that have caused uh, damage, so to speak, in that regard. Um, mm-hmm. And I struggle with that as well. I think I think everyone, uh, mm-hmm. that's why I want to do this show, mm-hmm. is, is, is everyone can redeem themselves. And sometimes I pause and think, down to even the child molesters too that i i go back and forth i understand at times mm-hmm. they're very sick individuals and then i understand at times saying that uh from the perspective of someone uh, people that i know that have have been on the receiving end of the molestation and what it's done to the families and it's, it's hard for me to say mm-hmm. oh i want those people to have help it's a very difficult subject mm-hmm. and it's interesting yeah. to, to bring up and i hope people do see this to to uh as it pertains back to the the subject we were talking about this and at the beginning to smash the perspective or perspective perception there we go perception of who charles manson was mm-hmm. instead of this phenomenon mm-hmm. it, it, by your estimation and based on what you've told me he's a he's a very very small man in many regards not just literally yeah. but uh and 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 a no good individual wants to take advantage of some kids and it's interesting the amount of people that I know uh, that are fa- absolutely fascinated, and if he was alive today, they 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 want to be with him. He's a free man. It's just I, I don't know. I'd love to send him the video of him on that hook. Anybody? <laughs> oh yeah, anybody there's, there's looking there's up to him. Surveillance on that hook <laughs> that would destroy a little bit of the myth right away. Him <laughs> just squirming on a yeah, thing well, on it, the it should. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. what you're really talking about is that um, you know, unfortunately, many of our youth globally um, idolize him. That's right. And, you know, for most of us, that's beyond our comprehension. You know, it's, it's not just because I have personal knowledge of him or because I know him or, and I have the experience of having spent many years with him. Had I not done that, mm-hmm. you know, I would still take issue with the idea that youth idolize him for what they believe he stood for. And it's a little hard to discern in that what that might have been, right. you know, what it is that they think he stood for anti-establishment. You see, I mean, I think that's where the, you know, the idea of the um, race war came from and, and yeah. um, you know, his failure to have his music produced. And so really what he's doing is re- repeating that same pattern. Right. Uh, I have a, uh question i just i don't remember if you had answered that or answered this earlier on it's kind of a maybe a complex question might require kind of a complex Mm. answer just mentioning the race war thing because you had said earlier i don't remember what your answer was to whether or not he whenever he was locked up was kind of under the uh uh protection of aryan brotherhood but was there ever kind of a I don't know if there was more of a threat of violence because, or if you had said you were locked up with Panthers or if there was Panthers around him, because if you know, you believe the helter skelter theory that, you know, he was going to frame the black Panthers and start this race war and then come back and take over the world. Cause he thought the blacks were too dumb to run the world. Like was that something that he, do you think he actually believed or was there threats of violence against him from like a, I guess a uh, Black Panther um, contingency. Contingency, yeah. No, no, I don't believe that for a second. You know, the thing about Charlie is that 
um, he loved black men, pure and simple. He loved having sex with them, had sex with them quite often. Um, it was not unusual to see him in the shower, you know, enjoying himself uh, sexually with black men. So no, you know, this idea of, of uh, you know, manipulating blacks and race war and this and that, um, simply stated is utter nonsense. Um, <laughs> it has no foundation or basis in reality. Um, and again, I'm talking from experience, yeah. um, you know, in that context. Uh, it's not something that he said, it's his actions, what he did, how he interacted. Um, you know, those all, all have value. It's, it's, it's a heightened form of a body language, if you will, taking to the extreme. So um, it's just him not believing any of the things he said and kind of going back to the thing is like, he's a dumb opportunist who came up with a lot of people say also, this could have been a Vince Bulgios, Bulgos, I can't remember his, how to say his last name, kind of one of his theories of what was going on. But my kind of what I had said in the beginning, I think this all comes down to him being bitter about his, you know, his music not getting made. And so he, you know, here's what we can mm -hmm. Oh Yeah. Let's frame blacks and we'll kill these you know these people that live in the house that uh just coincidentally the beach boys producer used to live in and we're not even sure if he still lives there mm -hmm. and then kind of random yeah. with a yeah. grocery store couple i think one of the lessons to learn here is if charlie's a failed artist and hitler's a failed artist we should just support all <laughs> artists <Yeah. laughs> uh, just to keep mm -hmm. them off the trail of destruction yeah <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think that comes down to in, in yeah. Next terrible painting I'm seeing, I'm buying. I'm buying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Right. <laughs> that is well, that has value. It does. Just being yeah. supportive. Um <laughs> what's it called? As as we're, we're we'll we'll wrap up the episode here. Is there something a couple more things you wanted to touch on? Mm -hmm. A couple more things you wanted to touch on in re in regards? No, uh I feel um verified in my opinion. Yeah. Coming into this, hearing that uh, more people agree with me who have actual experience. Very well. And is, Mike, is there some things that you you'd like to add that weren't that weren't added in regards to kind of giving the full picture of your personal experience with Charles Manson? Yeah, it it, it again. I've I've said it, and, and um, but it bears repeating. You know, this is not an individual, in my opinion, that should be idolized. This is this is someone that should be pitied. Um, pitied. You know, he, uh, you know, if we fancy ourselves humans um, within the construct of what that really means, right? Then he he is deserving of our pity, um, but only that. Um, you know. Nothing about Charlie uh, exemplifies um, anything that um, I would want to see become a mainstay right. uh, within, within our society. There's no example there that facilitates um, what it is to be a better human being. And that's really what the damage done is about. Right. Is, is to talk about, you know, those of us who have um, been damaged, why we've been damaged, and um, how we master that adversity. So mastering yeah. adversity is really the key. And, and uh, no, you know, how uh, we do that. We do that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was just saying there's no redemption story with Charles Manson. There's none there. It's I just, don't think so. It's just no. empty and hollow, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's like with We're anything, I think agreement. he believed the hype. Right. Of himself. I agree. I agree. I mean, you know, it's, you know, if people, and I'll say this um, about Charlie, if, if people have legitimate questions that they really want to know uh, about the man, the individual, then ask him and I'll do my best to answer him because I did spend 10 years with him and there's a right. lot there. Again, I am not going to perpetuate the myth of uh you know that this was some um hell of a guy yeah um no i think the only 
the only interesting part about your experience with him is just that the fact that he's like such a huge part of the fabric of American culture, just with because he symbolizes yeah. the downfall of the hippie. Right. So his, his his place in history is way more interesting than him. Like I don't give a fuck about him as a he, he can rot in hell for right. all I care. Right, right. Um, but yeah, it's more about yeah. just like he's just he's just an important part of American history uh, in a bat in a terrible way. So I think that's just the interesting part. And my, I don't think anybody <laughs> here, us three, really want even wanted to make build him up whatsoever. Absolutely, <laughs> no. No, no, that wasn't my impression in coming into this. I, I you know, the, we had an opportunity here to um, shed some light um, right. on some very personal issues. And, you know, how people take that um, is really their prerogative. Yeah, I've and given up on caring what other people the, take. People on the internet are, well, <laughs> they'll, they'll take it however yeah. they want, no matter what we say. <laughs> they, 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 yeah, that's yeah. what I was saying at the beginning. They, they're going to say not nice things about this episode just like they typically do and that's okay it's uh even when they say terrible things they're still fans because well, they're sure watching so it's okay um these are the same that that the blessing of our country? Ranch, yes you're right mike it what, is what's that said isn't that the blessing of the country it's the blessing <laughs> of the country man free yeah. speech I, I get enjoyment out of it yeah, it's, yeah. it's a great marketing yeah. tool when they comment and say how terrible i am how terrible you are but the reality is I'm still sober. You're still free. And we're doing this because we like to do it. And it helps some people. Yeah. And this, this, this yeah. episode was a little different. Like, as I said, this was some, this was some, yeah. it was a, it was an interest piece. And, and with that being said, uh, in the next yeah. week or two, we, we have a lineup of other lifers with some incredible stories coming out here. And so, so people are going to actually get a yeah. chance to see yeah. you interview some people instead of being interviewed. Cause now people are getting used to seeing yeah. you being interviewed, yeah. but you're going to be doing the damn interviewing. I'm kind of excited about that. Fuck yeah. yeah. You'll be doing the damage. Yeah, You'll be I doing the too. damage. <laughs> You'll be doing the damage. And I'm excited about that. Cause there's some really cool people yeah. coming from the anti-recidivism coalition that are coming on here. People have spent uh, time in Pelican Bay shoe, all that type of stuff coming out, changing people's lives. Those are yeah. some cool redemption stories. Yeah. I look forward to doing that and I'm going forward. I'm sure we'll have conversations. Things will pop up. Maybe we'll get emails, yeah. messages, good and bad about more context for this. Maybe we will revisit this in the context of something else we do, but this is, uh, we're trying something a little different. I'm glad we did. Um, yeah. I'm glad you came. No, this is fun. I appreciate it. I'm glad you came. I'm always glad that Brian's here. He, he's, he doesn't want to be on camera, man. One, <laughs> one time earlier, he was real bummed. Mike, you called him Bruce. When he said I wasn't it, bummed. You were bummed. bummed. I didn't care. <laughs> I don't Jokes. take it personal. Jokes. It was a good question, so I was like, hell yeah. My, my mistake. <laughs> I'll Jokes. never forgive you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> He's real hurt. He's real hurt. Um, but I, but uh, I appreciate everyone that uh, will tune in on the audio platforms, all the people that say the good and bad things on YouTube. And uh, guess what? We're going to just keep pumping out content because we can and want to the ways we want to yeah. and that's that's also a beautiful yeah. thing just like you guys can say any yeah. any terrible yeah. thing you want but the reality is we enjoy this and it does help people and um and it does interest people and that's cool to be able to do some shit that has that sort of value and uh that's mm -hmm. my piece on it you got you got anything else to add all good all good well mike uh we'll be in touch of course yeah yeah happy we did this i'll let you know when it comes out and Thanks for watching. We'll go from there. Yeah. And let's uh, not forget to thank the listeners. Always. Always thank the listeners. Yeah, Always we're giving the, the haters too much attention. We should give the <laughs> no. people who like us the attention too. Uh, I, mean, I thought I did. I thought I did, but it's hot in here. So uh, I could be losing some brain cells. I don't know. I can't call it. Uh yeah, but truly thank the listeners because there's a lot more there's a lot more support than negative. It's just uh yeah, sure. just gotta talk about it because I wanted to, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well let's just let's just say to them weigh in and tell us where you want us to go very well my friend we'll talk soon